Thank you, Juice. Thank you very much. Um, so today I have a little bit of a double task, um, which is to chair a wonderful panel. Um, so I think before get going, uh, and the, the second task, of course, is to introduce myself, a little bit of my work. But maybe before uh, get going, I would like to invite on the stage uh, these three wonderful colleagues um, from uh, Regen uh, Network, uh, Gregory and Daniel, and uh, Alice uh, Sharp from uh, Invisible Dust. Um, so please join me on the stage so I don't feel lonely here. Although I have my little slime old friend, so effectively I'm not completely alone. Okay, so um, the introduction that I'm going to make, of course, it's really trying to to kind of frame it a little bit the debate we will have today here, but also it will give a few examples of, uh, of my work that I think will contribute to, to the discussion and, and tie in with, with the wonderful work that my colleagues uh, here are doing. Um, we, on, on, on the surface, I think it seems like we are dealing with different things. Uh, Alice dealing with particles, I'm dealing, I'm dealing with cells, and maybe uh, 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 Daniel uh, and, and, and Gregory are dealing uh, with, uh, with bits of data. But uh, this is just a very superficial look at the work. I think there are uh, fundamental uh, intersection uh, be between our work that converge in, in, in giving uh, form or giving shape uh, or multiple potential form and shape to, to future commons. And I think the, the, the idea of these sessions is to kind of dive in uh, um, to, to what uh, you know, the future commons may, may be made of, or the kind of stuff that we will be able to bring in our uh, cities and in our uh, uh, urban sphere to, 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 to give it a, a future shape. So to start and frame this conversation, I'd like to uh, just refer to a little quote from an article, recent article to the New York Times. Um, maybe this is just not working right now. Yeah. And it's from Bruno Latour, a French philosopher, and it says, the medical revolution, uh, commonly attributed to the genius of Pasteur, should instead be seen as a result of an association between not just doctors, nurses, and hygienists, but also worms, milk, sputum, parasites, cows, and farms. Science was social then, not merely because it was performed by people. Rather, science was social because it brought together a multitude of human and non-human entities and harnessed their collective power to act and transform the world. So I think I can easily apply this notion to the way I intend uh, creative uh, transdisciplinary practice, like the ones we, we exemplified. Personally, I co-founded my studio, which is called Ecologic Studio in 2005, and more recently, I have established a consortium called Photosynthetica, uh, which uh, becomes a, pl a practicing platform that gives more agency, I think, both to our clients and towards tackling uh, larger societal issues. Um, what we do with, with Photosynthetica is initiate research project, like some of the examples you, you see here, of hacking uh, uh, non-human behavior of, uh, for instance, a, a, a silk tarantula, uh, to begin to build the fabric of our cities, and develop innovative technologies as well as curate design scenarios to actualize them in the real world. So this is really about getting it done uh, now. As we heard before, there is not much time uh, before we, we are too late. So these scenarios involve a distributed cohort of several interested stakeholders, human and non-human, micro and macro scale systems. So in my early interest uh, in, in ecologic architecture and environmental design, uh, brought me to realize very soon that there was a kind of design bias, if you want, in contemporary culture, which uh, I could call uh, the kind of sanitized ideal of nature that today we have, um, which is often, uh, let's say, cleaned from its darkest and most uncontrollable aspects. So this may, may well be one of the most persistent uh, elements that we inherited from modernity as that has come to shape uh, our contemporary cities or the spaces of our common. Modern master planning, we all know, uh, uh, introduced the idea of zones, of zoning, separating functions rationally uh, um, and technically and technologically. Of course, uh, to deal with processes of contamination and pollution, that was the first uh, intent. 
Uh, but the results of this separation was that uh, the most fundamental level of our experience or this byproduct of urbanization just disappeared. So we rationally know that they exist, but uh, at the basic level of our experience, they vanish from our reality. So this is the origin of what I call the metabolically linear city. Uh, we inhabit uh, the, the, the middle and of course we know that we are fed from resources coming from sometimes faraway places and a lot of output uh, goes out but we don't uh, really see or uh, uh, feel uh, these elements so closely. So uh, uh, this model of course has an impact uh, on, the, on the biosphere and I think we all also acknowledge that. But as we all know, there is also a kind of failure to act, and, and this is one of the issues that we are discussing here today, how do we can accelerate this process. Of course, there are a lot of elements to it, but the one I want to, to, to just focus our attention uh, for a second is precisely I promise I didn't stage it, but I think it's a kind of live demonstration of how dependent we are from these flows uh, of energy, matter and information. Uh, <laughs> without whose without we, we, we can't even uh, have this uh, meeting and this conversation. So, of course, um, the, the, I was, I was you know, to connect back the, the, this kind of sanitized uh, version of cities also extend to the concept of ecology. Uh, one of the, fir the first model of the biosphere was the cybernetic model. Uh, it was in fact a model uh, based on our understanding of machines and derived from this understanding. So, of course, it gave us uh, insights, but uh, through these models, we came to believe that the rationally organized environment that we today consider our modern li living habitats also apply to the biosphere as a whole. And I'm waiting for my slides to come back, and they hopefully will, but in the meantime, I carry on. Um, of course, uh, we now live in this age of ubiquitous computing. We have the ability to sense the world in an unprecedented way. And this gives us or gave us this uh, image of what scientists call the Anthropocene, uh, the age in which our civilization has impacted every ecosystem uh, on, ho on Earth. So in a way, we know this is happening because the machines that we built to scan it, to sense it, uh, tell us so. So this is in a way interesting for me and paradoxical to a certain extent um, because we may be already in a sort of post-anthropocenic condition. Uh, it's true that we have a global impact, but let's say uh, uh, the, the agency uh, uh, of the systems of the world may be uh, no longer entirely human. So in other words, the miniaturization and distribution of digital systems has reached inhuman complexity and unpredictability. So human creations such as urban infrastructures now escape our comprehension and constitute what we may call new natures. Therefore, and perhaps paradoxically in the Anthropocene age, we need more than ever a non-anthropocentric model of reasoning. That's why I brought my little friend here. Um, that is, while our current narrative uh, is uh, still dominated by a form of technocratic positivism, the world is already moving in a different, in a different framework. So, in my view, the unplanned metropolis of the Anthropocene is dominated by waste, pollution, various forms of dark nature that are the new protagonist, forming an urban terrain at, at once sinister, but also fertile of opportunity. So today I was going to articulate um, this narrative at three levels. And this is something that we will share with, with my colleagues here. Uh, at the methodological level, uh, we operate at a different scale, really at a territorial scale, perhaps even at the scale of the entire biosphere. Uh, this implies, of course, questioning the concepts of zone and typology and program, which uh, have evolved into notions of operational field, resolution, and algorithmic protocol. 
This is um, actually a project we were involved uh, last, from last year, we're since involved now, in the capital of Estonia. Okay, um, guys, I'm sorry about this. Of course, it's, uh, it's a little harder to keep the, the focus and I, I would just ask you if you please bear with me um, a couple of more minutes. I'm going to try to close my presentation, although I, I have uh, still you know, I still wanted to go through some of the example uh, of my work um, so that we have some kind of material, uh, a sort of, uh, um, let's say, case study to, to discuss later also with, uh, with my colleague. So very quickly here I was talking about the kind of methodological level, which I see in my screen, but not in the big one. And, um, and this is, a, as I mentioned before, a project that we have uh, or we are working on in, in the city with the city of Tallinn, the capital of Estonia. It's a, it's a really exciting project because it's about redesigning the blue-green substratum of Tallinn. So essentially we are collaborating with the local university, uh, um, Estonian Academy of Arts, and with the um, uh, con city council. And we have been using uh, a set of digital technologies, uh, satellite monitoring technologies to get a very detailed, extremely high resolution analysis of the biological active substratum of the city and then from that uh, uh, use the digital tools and algorithms to uh, uh, basically start uh, giving form or giving shape to these systems. It would be very important to see my drawings up there because otherwise it's just impossible for people to understand. So please, if you can sort this out, it will be great. Exactly. So this is one of the, uh, for instance, product of this uh, algorithmic uh, analysis, uh, looking at the water or wet substratum of the city. And this is instead looking at kind of urban networks and infrastructures, especially wastewater infrastructure. And these are some of the new emerging networks that we are simulating. So as you can see, the previous ones have very much centralized uh, uh, organization, whereas here we're beginning to uh, work with distributed intelligence and therefore begin to visualize the city as something very different uh, than we are used to. And this is also part of the, uh, the, the process of beginning to reimagine the infrastructure of the city from this distributed perspective that we have been uh, mentioning so far. Here are some visualizations in different seasons and how these systems may respond to these uh, climatic fluctuations. At the complete other end of the spectrum, of course, these processes are activated by organisms that are often invisible to the human eye, like photosynthetic algae or photosynthetic cyanobacteria. Uh, this is a project that we have uh, um, in, implemented uh, for Expo Milano in 2015 and is a photosynthetic canopy which enables the growth of photosynthetic algae in, in, within, within its fabric. So it's really an interface between the city and nature uh, uh, that, that, that basically it didn't exist before. It's a world first in that sense. So what we want to do at this level is to challenge the logic of traditional construction processes, of course, and create what we call biodigital assemblages. Uh, with these creations, I have tested the possibility for a co-evolutionary architecture that can grow or be grown or be cultivated as an extended cohort of bio-citizens. So the notion of citizenship expands by the introduction of these new interfaces where microorganisms and digital protocols uh, all collaborate. This is a recent project in Dublin where we have created a similar system but as a facade, I call it urban curtain, uh, especially devoted to uh, sucking uh, CO2 and pollutants from the air uh, which goes through the snaky uh, algae filled pipes and then is released on the top. And this is a close up of the polymer based system. And another one is uh, one of uh, my proudest moments was to present this uh, permanent project in Astana, the capital of Kazakhstan, uh, for Expo 2017. Again, it's, a, it's a, called Biotech Hut and it's a prototype of a dwelling that is powered and fed entirely by microalgae. Within this project, we were able to grow around 1,600 liters of cyanobacteria. Uh, that is uh, producing the equivalent of energy of 10 kilowatt hour per day. That's enough for a UK home to be powered. And also vegetable proteins 
uh, that would feed about 12 adults, the equivalent eight cows. Just to give you some of the metrics of what can be achieved with these systems when they are integrated in our urban fabric. So these are real solutions that we are developing today. So finally, to conclude, um, at a conceptual level, here's my friend Fizarum Polycephalum again. I'm suggesting a repositioning of the role of the creative practice, which includes, of course, digital as well as artistic and, and material practices within a broader enabling role as curators of a wide range of human and non-human agents now endowed with intelligence and creative pot potentials. So we are not creating anymore by ourselves, but as part of this expanded uh, collective intelligence. Like in the Fizarro machine, where the slime mold's ecological intelligence manifests itself in the morphological convolutedness of his network body and the fuzziness of his distributed spatial memory defying both the classical canons of beauty in symmetry and proportion and the rational logics of efficient engineering. So, uh, this is pretty much the conclusion of my, of my part, my introductory part, and I hope you also uh, enjoyed a little bit of the work I'm, I have proposed. So, I think it's now time to pass the mic to Gregory and Daniel. I think you guys are going to uh, have a joint presentation. Gregory and Daniel uh, are uh, CEOs of Regen Network, uh, which is uh, essentially, has the name suggest a network. They are based in the US, albeit on different coasts, I learned, but uh, their team is uh, spread throughout the world. And their focus is on uh, developing a blockchain based technology for smart contracting platform designed to verify the ecological state of health of ecosystems. So essentially it's about involving the largest number of stakeholders in verifying and uh, exchanging data about the health of the world ecosystem. So this is, sounds really exciting to me and of, of course I, I can't wait to see more about it. Thank you.